a home is supposed to be where you're safe. And the Amityville Horror destroys all that, that safe thinking. This happened right after William Peter Blatty's book, The Exorcist, and the movie The Exorcist came out circa 1973-74. There seemed to be a hunger, a longing, perhaps maybe even kind of a, a spiritual question that was looming large about good versus evil. Even people who professed to be agnostic or atheists were sleeping with the lights on after going to see that movie, clutching crucifixes, and running back to church. It seemed to provide a climate in which Amityville could breed. The house itself had now become a personality, thanks to its distinctive top floor windows. Everybody would say to me, what did you think about those two eyes? The eyes that watch you. I mean, I've heard this a lot. They became the eyes of the house, you know, and if you look at it, you say, that house is looking at me, and that gave it this evil persona. Something's watching, something's hidden, something's watching. The next incarnation of the Lutz's story came when Amityville got the Hollywood treatment. What happened to them is an experience in terror you will never forget. And you will believe in the Amityville horror. George and Kathleen Lutz are with us this morning to talk about what happened during those 28 days in Amityville. Lutz's, good morning to you both. The hype over Amityville on national television and told their story to an eager public. Within a week, Kathy's hand had been touched by something that we discussed and couldn't explain. It was just something unseen. We also had hordes of flies that would appear within two rooms. And no matter how many times we would kill them, they would reappear. When they sold those books and the motion picture came out, all hell broke loose. It was a media frenzy. I mean, people just descended on the village of Amityville. People from Ireland, people from England, people from all over Europe. They were plagued, not by ghosts inside or demons, but by tourists. In the rainstorms and thunderstorms, as many as 50 people staying there with their hands together, uh, just looking at the house like it was a religion. On Ocean Avenue, people's lawns were just crushed with people parking their cars and trying to get to the horror house. I had busloads. People in my backyard picnicking, nuns from Sweden. They got stuck on my driveway. I don't know how they even got down my driveway. People running up and wanting to grab a piece of the house, pulling up a piece of the lawn, taking off a piece of the siding of the house. One woman hit a cop over the head so hard with a pocketbook, she almost knocked him out. Anything so that they could go and peer into the windows and really be annoying. It just went on and on and on. But just as thousands of tourists seemed convinced by the Amityville story, so there were growing numbers who suspected a hoax. Jay Anson writes this thick tome, The Amityville Horror True Story, and I thought something here smells bad. The original articles that came out, they said that they did not see any human forms and that they just had strange noises, uh, bumps, banging in the pipes, things like this. They were experiencing what on the surface appeared to be some low-level psychic phenomenon. No levitation, no windows being shattered, no doors wrenched off their hinges by unseen forces. By the time they got to the book, they had green slime and red slime and marching bands and Jody the Demon Pig. We had 116 obvious errors, physical errors, in the book. And that's before you get down to floating pigs. There was a picture that Missy had drawn, one of the Lush children, of Jody, the demonic pig that she said would often appear up on the second floor windowsill with its red eyes peering in. We started talking to some of the neighbors, and one of the neighbors said to us, oh, what, what does it look like? And we showed the picture that was in the book, and they said, oh, that's the cat that Ronald DeFeo called the pig because he was fat. Well, the pig happened to be my, my wife had a Persian cat. And I, it was a Persian cat, I'm sure. This cat would actually jump up into the window and stand there and stare with those red glowing eyes. And what about those infamous flies? My God, the murder took place. The victims were removed after 48 hours. The house was then sealed up and the heat was on. 
just doesn't take a brain scientist to figure out how you end up with flies. As part of their investigation, Jordan and Moran interviewed Jim and Barbara Cromarty, who bought the house after the Lutzes left. We asked them if when they moved into the house they had made any major repairs. Because if you read the book, it, you get the impression that this whirlwind of paranormal activity sweeps through the house and leaves it in a state of shambles. No, they tell us. Everything was in perfect shape when they walked through it and they made their purchase. My husband did a program in which he debated George Lutz, and George Lutz tried to say that the window in the house had slammed down on his son's hand, and he had taken him to Brunswick Hospital to be treated. So my husband said, well, we'll just subpoena the records of Brunswick Hospital, and then you can prove that. He said, well, I didn't really take him to the hospital. We bandaged it at home. So the story would change if you tried to pin him down I remember when we walked into one of the rooms, there was a window where it was claimed if you stood in the center of the room, the window would suddenly open and shut violently all by itself. It was on the second floor. So we ran into this room, Rick and I, and Rick pointed out that the floorboards seemed to be slightly uneven, and he started shifting his foot along the floor, and suddenly the window shot up. I thought I was going to jump out of my shoes backwards. I shrieked. The counterweights are improperly set. And the window was such that if you did this, you could actually make this window go up and then come down. Confusion surrounds much of this. Um, I don't know that it, <laughs> that it will ever be undone in talking about evil. And evil is the absence of God's presence. And as such, then confusion is going to be part of that. The skeptics had gathered their evidence, and the believers prepared for battle. But what was the truth about the amateurville horror? Two years after they fled from their home, claiming that they had been driven out by supernatural forces, the tale of the Lutz family was published as the Amateurville Horror, a true story. It was an instant bestseller, and author Jay Anson became the focus of a furious row over what really happened. What it did was open my eyes to the fact that somebody could write a book, put right on the front cover a true story, and then make up 90% of what was inside. I spoke to Jay, uh, and I said, Jay, do you believe this story? And he said, I'm, I'm a writer. That's what I do is I write. That's all. You know, whether or not it's true or whether it's not true, that's for somebody else to decide. Of course literary license was taken. We're not in support of, of this aspect of the Amityville horror. Peter Jordan and Rick Moran confronted Anson with their evidence that the book was not a true story, but a work of fiction. He said, you're one of those naysayers. You're a skeptic who likes to write non-ghost stories. I like to make money. Jay said to me, I'm a writer. My only interest is to write a best-selling book so that I can build a house in Mayorka and never have to write again. And one day I predict, he said, that you are going to be sitting there broke, writing your little non-ghost stories, and I'm going to be in an island out in the Bahamas or somewhere with a truckload of cashmere sweaters. And I remember thinking it was the funniest thing. And I started cackling, and he said, what's so funny? And I said, that is the most ridiculous fantasy that any millionaire could ever have. And then after that, I was coming home from somewhere out in Long Island, had the radio on, and Jay Anson, author of The Amityville Horror, suffered a uh, tragic heart attack today, and I thought, oh, he never got to enjoy that truckload of cashmere sweaters. 